one. Welcome to the Kingston Creative Art Walk. We're here with you virtually. And this one, I mean, the city is going to be lit. We're talking about literature. And the purpose of this art walk is to showcase and celebrate our Jamaican literature in their different forms, whether it's poetry, scripts, novels, you name it, you'll be hearing it today. So if you are, thank you for joining us online. And if you are a poet or a writer, please also share with us your work online and on Kingston Creative's channels, whether on Instagram or Twitter. Thank you for joining us again. And to start us off, we're going to be hearing from our creative writing students from the UN Literature Department. And to start us off, we have a video from Delroy McGregor. So please enjoy his work. And today, I will be performing Frederick Echo's Sometimes I'm the Girl on the Bus. I hope you enjoy. Frederick Echo's Head full of white, blue shirt, sucking to his torso. Khaki pants, black suede, a size too big. He says he's from Ghana, where he would spend evenings watching gulls and fishermen hauling catches so big they'd tear nets. He says his family was cursed. His mother poisoned his sister. His father died from cancer. Even his uncle in Panama died from pneumonia. He says he knows labor like the cows and the carts out in the field when it is ripe. He says he worked most days in the bush, cutting cane, banana, pulling up yellow yam, hands stained from red dirt, Sweat burning his eyes, smearing his lips, his forehead, the black back of his neck, voice weak for water. He says comfort came from his wife, Angela, who died 12 years ago. On Sundays, they would watch sunsets near the bay by the Gold Coast, come home to her fufu slow cooking in the yard. Now he's in Jamaica listening to poems in Manly Amphitheater, where we sit on the ledge each Tuesday. He hopes one day to hear her voice in a published piece, to see her in a gallery, to smell her scent in sea breeze. Sometimes, one, I want to revisit the ice cream weekends at Dead End Beach. My father would ask questions like, what do you want to do at my age? I would say to him, I want to be an artist. Forget the question and bite the cone. Two, I want to revisit the reggae beats of Sean Paul, Gentleman and Capitan in my father's van, roaming the Montego Bay hip strip. We would go to sports bars and high school hangouts like Coral Cliff, Ask strangers to take our picture on his flip phone. We'd wrap red rags around our heads and mean mug like thugs. Three. I want to forget when they caught him with drugs. When mommy dropped the phone and held the kitchen counter. I want to forget the nights in bed. Listening to the ice cream truck roam the road. Knowing he was still sitting in the States. Where four walls... Men with dogs and a barb fence kept us apart. The girl on the bus. The sun was ripe that morning, even the biting breeze. We descended past red awnings, past green coconut trees. My hands sweated in my pockets, soaking smooth plastic tickets. My ribcage under assault at every bump and jerk as we turned away from potholes and patchwork. She was looking for a seat and sat beside me. Her flat nose, fat red lips, and brown skin held my attention like a private plane zipping past a truck on a highway. Hello, my name is Mary. Nice to meet you, Mary. She was an aroma of spices, nutmeg, cinnamon powder, vanilla. On the subject of cornmeal porridge, our voices lifted above our classmates, the bus engine, the wind in our ears, the BBC announcer on the radio. 
we learnt we both like Saturday morning cartoons, stew peas on a Sunday, sand on our skin at the beach, the smell of mixed concrete. That evening, we sat at the back, sharing earphones, mouthing the words, rude boy it is a pity, my hands sweating in hers, my ribcage under assault. Wow. That was beautiful. I mean, I'm sure you'd agree with me when I say that that sounded like an aroma of spices. So our next performer we're going to be hearing from is with us on the live. And she is Zanzi Bethel. And she's also from the creative department, the literature department. So please welcome her. Hi. Hi, everyone. Um, so I know at the beginning you said that you are representing Jamaican writers, but I'm actually a Caribbean writer. I'm from the Bahamas. Um, but I will say that my writing has um, really developed um, in the creative writing department under um, Tanya Shirley, who is obviously a Jamaican writer, I say that my writing by the voice of Jamaica uh, has two years Jamaica inspired writing. Um, so, how many poems am I allowed to? To do? Tavia? Well, you could you could go ahead and perform one or two for us. Um, this first one is called Gollin Woman. I've quoted Tony McKay at the beginning from his song um, Exuma, the Old Bear Man. I came down on a lightning bolt, nine months in my mama belly. When I was born, the midwife scream and shout. I had fire and brimstone coming out of my mouth. I come from heavy bottom women who stand up and pound fufu in the hot sun. I come from big face fighter people on my mother's side. Carlotta seed that sliced man head clean off with big machete. I born from people who dig graves with their fingernails to put down dead babies. I born of revolution people, dutty bookman kind, same ones that call down fire and torment from the sky. I born of bush, rum and goat blood. I come from hard heel women who grind unholy men to dust and sprinkle ashes under the bedroom windows of their enemies. Evelyn Turin who salt their thighs before laying down with man. Walk with frayed yellowing bits of Bible verse tucked in their bosoms. Hang black bottles from the branches of the Casarina tree listening for spirit. I come out of Albert and Rosina House on Palm Avenue in the Grove, not the White Grove, the Black Grove, the one with the hog, plum, sour, cherry, 12 hens, one yard cock. I am Viola Sands stock, who get chopped up and burned at supper time in Sandy Point, Elytra. But the man who did it, he ain't no kin to me, thank God. Viola called down 13 generations of tormentation for him. I born where pink sand lay like sheen over dry bones. I born in deep night in the last settlement at the end of Queens Highway, where Miss Sweetie still does shapeshift into black eye cat to terrorize Sister Dinah, that rank since she did teeth her good, good husband almost forever ago. I born where the okra fingers never tough. 
And the next poem that I'm going to do, um, this one is called A Play in Four Acts. Act one, natural birth. Lights flicker in a small room in the West Wing Labor Ward, Princess Margaret Hospital. The walls are muddy green, old floor tiles are chipped. Nurse, please, it hot, Lord, the pain, hot, help me. A cleaning attendant in pink scrubs peers into the room as she passes. You should have think about this when you had your front tear open for man. Long, bony fingers dig. Stop, stop, why are you doing that? Please don't hurt me. Shut up. Act two, blindness. Moonlight filters through a dusty window onto the nurse's station at General Intake, South Beach Clinic. Patient files are arranged haphazardly. There's a strong smell of bleach and Lysol spray. Please, please help me. There's blood in my baby's eye. An old woman seated in the cracked blue chair down the hall cranes her neck to hear. Miss. Calm down, take a number and sit. But there's blood in my baby's eye. What do I do? I need to see the doctor now. Please, ma'am, sit. Act three. Words. It's an excellent genetic disease, FEVR, familial exudative vitreal retinopathy. The mutation is on the F4 gene sequence. The head doctor pauses to listen as he draws a long, thick needle from its plastic packaging. The wiry intern's face is flushed. So how come you know all of this? Because I can read. Oh, cesarean section at five. Huge silver lamps hang from the ceilings of a surgical theater in Jackson Memorial Hospital, Miami. A crinkled paper sheet is stretched above the gurney. The nurses wear white crocs. A clock on the wall ticks loudly. Oh God, please, I don't want to die. I want to live, please. A surgeon with broad hands says, stop the bleeding, get more blood. The nurse's shoes squeak across the waxed floors as they scurry away. Beep, 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 beep. A clenched fist slackens. God? Be. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing those two with us. And we'd love, love to hear, you know, the meaning behind those. So we're going to give you a moment to just catch your breath after such a beautiful performance. And then we'll go over to our next performer, Christopher Allen, after which we'll talk to you some more about those two lovely poems. Thank you so much, Zanzi. No, guys, if you're just joining us, this is the Kingston Creative Art Walk and the city is lit today. We're talking about literature, Jamaican literature, Caribbean literature. That was a Caribbean poet just now. And so we encourage you to share with us what you think about the performances today, whether you're on Instagram at Kingston Creative JM, or you can follow them on Twitter at KG and Creative. Use the hashtag, share with us what your thoughts are on today's performances. Thank you for joining us. So next up, we're gonna be listening to Christopher Allen. He will also be performing some poetry for us. So please welcome him. Hey, thank you. Thank you for having me. Um, so my name is Christopher, but I prefer Topher. Um, that's the name I publish under. <laughs> And with that, I'll begin by reading my first poem, which is called Home is Mama's Voice. 
Home is mama's voice. From mama's veranda, I can see thick cane fields, house stops, the foam at the river's mouth, and where the sea spits out garbage on the sand. The water is blue. I imagine it is the same color as the skin of slave boys and the moonlight. The roars and ripples are its expression of pain. It is seasoned with sweat and bubbles with the blood and bones of my forebears. There are islands as green as ash bonnet pepper and ships floating like sliced breadfruit. And I know a home is not just the invention of outside, but it is a view from a hill. It is Saturday soup simmering on charcoal stove, the veranda that your mother, grandmother, and her mother have slaved on their knees, prayed and polished until it is as red as a bandana. Home is mama's voice, singing gospel on Sundays, then spitting curse words across the fence. Home is a little boy running downhill, his legs long like a river, black as sand, a plastic bag in his hand, the parachutes in the breeze. He recites the short grocery list, two pounds sugar, half a bread, six eggs, one quart kerosene oil. Home is mama warning not to touch the lamp, reminding disobedient picnic yam rock stone. But as if, it, as if stick broke off in my ears, I move it. The busty, broad hip glass goddess. I fold small fingers firm around the waist, sculpt down a cold passageway for bathroom. The home sweet home, round belly vent, black with soot, is not always sitting snug in the grip of all the gold prongs. And I do not notice. A simple stumble, the shades throw too hot to catch. Splintered traps are set for bare feet. Cousins flash fingers and sing, yes, no, Spanish tongue. And that is when I learn that people can turn back and wait until belt buckle lays backside. And I'll share another one, and that's called The Feast of the Sea. The southern tip of the island curves like the hook of an umbrella. My hometown is right where your index finger would rest when you hold off the rain. This bend of land was not featured on early maps. Some blame the cartographers, but I believe the sea has been here before. And the land was sprawled out asleep under the blanket of beating ripples. And I wonder if the slope in the front yard was red with sargasso, sargasso. And if the top of my house was sea level, then maybe the zinc wrinkles would be waves. Now the soil is loose and the salt I ate as a, as a child. You see speaks if you listen to the emptiness of shells scattered about my backyard. This lonely and crooked land, longing for death and to wash its head under running water, will stretch out its arms, beg the blue to open its mouth and gulp, dust by aching dust, rock by breaking rock, house by crumbling house, the families in them and all their black blood. Thank you. That's what I have for you. Thank you so much, Topher. I mean, I could say that. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. And of course, we'd also want to talk to you, you know, and to hear about your journey as a poet. Guys, we've heard from two beautiful poets from the Caribbean, Jamaica, and uh, is it Bahamas or Barbados? She will tell us again. And we can say that there is poetry in life. You just have to open your eyes to see it. So we are so appreciative of the fact that they were able to share with us their you know, poetry and were able to appreciate it in such an intimate way. So I'm gonna ask Zanzi if she could join us just to talk to us a little bit about her poetry and just her journey as a poet. So Zanzi, would you be so kind to join us again? I am here. Welcome back. Uh, mm -hmm. so, so us. I mean, remind us where you're from again. Is it Bahamas? Uh, Bahamas. Yes, the Bahamas. The Bahamas. The Bahamas. Well, tell us about those two poems that you performed for us today. Well, the first one, I now wish I had performed an, a different one, but um, the first one is 
it's really talking to a lineage. It's talking to a history that we often um, don't acknowledge. You know, it's talking to um, indigenous um, and African, Afro-Caribbean um, ways of understanding philosophies. You know, we push these these um, systems aside, but and they have been vilified. So, um, for instance, um, Obea. Um, Mayal, as you have in Jamaica, um, you have practices like Kumina, you have all these indigenous practices that have been um, vilified, have been pushed down, have been demonized, you know, and, and incorrectly. And it's I, I think that speaking to that um, is a part of the process of um, liberation. It's part of the process of understanding exactly how we came to be here, how our um, histories, our histories have been disrupted, you know, and not only have they been disrupted, they have been suppressed and they've been suppressed and demonized in ways that make us hate our own indigenous um, ways of life. And, you know, to speak so openly about these kinds of practices, about the ways that we actually survive. You know, um, if you look into the history, you will see that it, um, when it came time for emancipation um, and, and, and our actual transition legally from the legal status of being animals, it was not only 150 years ago, we were legally classified as animals in this colonial space. And the history books would have us believe that it was benevolent whites it was the benevolent master that freed us when that is not the case. You know, if you were to look into the history, you will see that um, what we did, it started with, with Haiti in 1791. It started with a, a, a Vudong ritual at Wakeman. Okay. Um, and it's, it's such an honor to be able to share, you know, our history and just to express ourselves through poetry. Wouldn't you agree? I do, I do, and it's 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 important for that voice. It's the the orality that needs to come forth because um, what we are doing as poets, especially as Caribbean poets, is translating our histories, our histories which have traditionally not been um, placed into the scribal. We don't have a long history of of scribal um, of working in the scribal tradition. Our histories are oral, um, but what happens when our history Histories or oral is that we lose a lot of that because we have lost our um, cultures, we've lost our traditions, we've lost our griots who, who keep these memories intact. And so what we have to do as poets, as writers, as historians is begin to transcribe our oral histories, our oral um, realities into the scribal tradition while still maintaining the voice and the integrity of the voice. We appreciate that and thank you so much for sharing that with us i mean where can we follow you to you know enjoy some more of your poetry and also to appreciate some of these histories that you also try to record through your poetry well for right now um i have not gone really public with my recent writings the only public work that has been going out of works that have been published in various um, spaces or as part of the national collections, but um, I I will be out soon, as soon as I conquer my crippling anxiety. <laughs> um, yeah. But I'm I'm my visual art is on Instagram. My photography and my painting I sometimes post to Instagram under um, Zanzi Moonface X A N X I Moonface. All right. Thank you so much, Zanzi, for sharing that with us. And maybe one of these days we will actually hear you again when, I mean, you weren't nervous today. We didn't see it coming out. So thank you for joining us today. And thank you for sharing your poetry with us. Thank you. And do we have Topher online with us still? We'd love to hear from him, you know, yeah, you're here. about his poetry. All right. You're here, Topher. Please yeah. join me. I mean, Tell the people about those two that you talked about, those two poems that you performed. Tell us a little bit about them. Uh, well, one of my first instincts as a writer was to recount my youth, my days as a, as a child. 
and especially to include my the geography, especially I found very interesting the geography of a rural area. And I'm from Clarendon and, and from where I live and where I live, I really could see the sea because I was living, I live on the hill and I could see that arm that bend in the, um, at the bottom curve of the island. And, and no, I just found it interesting that why as a writer have I never um, recorded this? And so I, my aim was really to capture the geography that was from my viewpoint and, this, and then also to tie that in with um, my experience as a child. Um, I, I can remember my first ever time visiting the, or going to the beach. And I, based on where the beach was located, I, I couldn't see the sea from, while approaching it. But as soon as I went around that corner, then there was this wide expanse of water. And this was my first time going to the beach. And I was wondering, and then these, and the waves are now coming in onto me. And I was like, so aren't we all afraid of this? Why don't we think that at any given point, that water will just come right over and grab us all? And so I was contemplating that and, and thinking, um, perhaps one day this water will say, hey, I want this land back. Because um, and, as a, and then also as a child, I, was, I saw a map of Jamaica, which didn't include the, the curve at the lower or the southern tip. And I thought, well, maybe the water has been here before. And, I, and again, I used to eat, eat the dirt in my yard and it did taste salt. So I was wondering, maybe the sea was really here. And so all of those contemplations, I figure, why not just put them in a poem, you're a poet. So it's, it's a lot of just thinking about the imagery, the geography, the, the um, experiences as a Jamaican and especially living in the rural area. Yeah, and looking beyond what the ice is. And, yeah, and certainly, certainly. You, you also were, uh, you won the Louis Bennett Covalley Prize for poetry in 2019. Talk to us a little bit. Yes. Uh, it was, whew, a lot. Still, I'm still, I still can't believe um, because I didn't consider myself a poet for a very long time. And for a very long time, I struggled with speaking and I struggled with writing. And, you know, so to be able to win something like um, a, a prize like that and be attached to such, an, a, such a powerful and important name as Louise Bennett is, is everything for me. And, 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 I really must say thank you to my dear, I call her my mother in craft, Tanya Shirley, who has taught me so much about writing. And I have to say always I'm absolutely grateful for how much she has enabled me, how much she has and basically showed me the whole world of writing. As when I started writing, I, if I go back and look at my previous, my first drafts, I, I cringe because I don't, you know, but it's just her helping me to own my talent. And, and it was an experiment, basically. It was me now coming out of Tanya's um, classes and saying, hey, let me try something with, with this work, with this that I've learned. And, and I won that, that prize. And yeah, so I'm just grateful. That's amazing. That's amazing. Yeah. And, and you also currently have a body of work that persons can, you know, purchase or, or find online or find you online. Where can we enjoy your work? Uh, every now and again, I post a few of my poems on my, on my Instagram. My, my Instagram name is Catalog of Bones, catalog.of.bones. And, but I, do, I, I haven't published a collection as yet. I'm still working on that. However, my poems are in different magazines. They're in the Caribbean Writer. The two that I read are in the Caribbean Writer magazine. Um, Pre-Caribbean Writing magazine, my poems are there as well. Um, the Lon um, Poetry London, my poems are there. Montreal Writes, poems are there. But still working on putting a collection together. All right, thank All right. you. Thank you are definitely looking forward to that collection. And of course, guys, please check out his Instagram page where you can also enjoy his poetry and share with us online how you felt about his performances. Tell them one more time where they can find you. Uh, catalog of Bones on, on Instagram. 
catalog.of.bones. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Thank you for joining us. We really appreciate it as well. All right, guys, there you have it. We certainly enjoyed those two beautiful poets who shared, you know, their history and their experiences with us through their poetry. We thank them for joining us and we thank you too for joining us and enjoying their poetry with us. Now, of course, it's all about literature and it's not, we can't talk about literature without talking to the Book Industry Association of Jamaica. We have with us Latoya Blackwood West and she's gonna be talking to us a little bit about you know, the Kingston Book Fest for 2021. I mean, what's that gonna look like? She's on camera smiling with me please join me on the platform here so we can talk about because <laughs> i mean everybody is waiting to hear what's going to happen for 2021 virtual a little live yeah what's well you know thank you for having me first of all um and i really enjoyed the poetry so <laughs> yeah, um, well done to the the poets and it's good to see you know the caribbean representation um and happy third anniversary to, to Kingston Creative. I know it's officially April, like maybe the next one, but yeah, basically it's amazing <laughs> that three years have passed already. Um, yeah, so going to book industry is the overall body. We represent Jamaica's book industry. We're an art umbrella organization. So authors, publishers, booksellers, distributors, and of course, you know, in the modern setting, we incorporate digital distribution platforms um, that, you know, deal with ebooks, audiobooks, et cetera, and accessibility. So for Kingston Book Festival, um, we were due to have our next, our, our staging, six staging last year, um, clearly because of what was happening with COVID. Um, we, we just didn't feel like, you know, pivoting um, to trying to just rush and do something online just to do it sick. So what we've done is spent the time observing what has been happening locally, internationally, and seeing how we can really deliver something that's impactful. That's always our um, goal. Uh, we are not necessarily a festival that's caught up with you know, the award-winning element and the prestige, which is good, but we are about grassroots work and community and, you know, ensuring that particularly for young people, we promote reading for fun, mm -hmm. you know, not necessarily reading to pass an exam or, you know, but, but making that connection between readers and, and authors or creators. Um, so we're very deliberate about that work. And, um, so we decided to, to put it to this year. We're looking at November 30th as a launch date and programming running from the 1st of December to the 5th. Um, you know, we're in the stage of planning now, so we don't have a program that we're going to reveal or anything to you at this moment. But we're happy to announce that, for example, we will be collaborating with Kingston Creative to do a literary mural um, which is right. I mean, that's like a dream come true, right? <laughs> I, think I, I glimpsed it on, 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 on some pages online. And guys, if you have not seen it, you need to see it because you're going to want to just go downtown to just take a picture in front of that. <laughs> so I think what was posted is just, you know, Andrea, as usual, just plant, um, you know, the seeds and, and I just come with the hoe and the park and everything to plow and make it happen, make it grow. So yeah, we, we will be doing the mural. We actually have one sponsor commitment towards the mural already, which was on the same day wow. that we started having that Twitter conversation. So we're looking forward to, you know, the usual suspects coming on board and supporting. So that's one public um, thing. And then we actually have a UK-based festival that deals specifically with programming for children who have said to us that they definitely, we're, we confirmed our partnership. Um, we're not ready to make a full announcement at this time, but uh, we are particularly concerned about the impact on children uh, in terms of remote learning, uh, with some children not even being able to access remote learning and how it's setting them back um, in terms of not just passing exams, but in terms of everything that reading does for the mind. Um, empathy, 
emotional security, you know, just being able to experience and to share. Uh, so we definitely want to ensure that, you know, while we always make provision for children, we have the school tours, et cetera, that won't be possible in person, but we're still going to um, do our best to ensure that children, you know, get something special out of this staging. More than likely, we're looking at a virtual staging. Our plan was really a hybrid um, festival, but we continue to monitor the public health um, guidance, you know, to see where we are towards the end of the year. We're trying to remain hopeful, um, but we see the inequalities where vaccines are concerned and all those other things that could mitigate risk. So, yeah. Um, we'll definitely continue to share, you know, any updates. Um, if people want to support Kingston Book Festival right now, you can do that through like purchasing merchandise. Uh, we partner with Rebel um, Women to do, um, we're in their online store. So okay. you could actually check them out there. We're online at KGN Book Fest on Twitter, Instagram, and on Facebook for Kingston Book Festival. Oh, that's so amazing. And I mean, as you talked about that, the whole arrangement to ensure that children enjoy reading, it's so important because our culture of reading when it comes to children is a punishment. Doing something and I'm saying, like, oh, pick up your book or read a book. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's a lot. It's, yeah. Fun and enjoying it and experiencing it. It's really, it, it's negative. And even though we don't realize it, we encourage children to view it in that way. So that's very refreshing to hear. Yeah, definitely. That, that's something that in terms of the start, the, fest, the festival was founded by BIAJ's former publishing director and a children's writer herself, Kelly Magnus, um, in 2011. And that's one of her passion points, just, you know, in terms of creating a space where we have representational and, and culturally relevant content for children. Um, so we're not saying they can't read about other countries or other, you know, writers outside of the Caribbean, but um, we know that representation was an issue. And so that's always been a core part of our mandate from an industry standpoint. It also makes perfect sense to um, encourage children to read and to, to encourage in this time a knowledge culture is, uh, is the is the present and it's the future where even if you're going into the the traditional careers a doctor the lawyer etc we're seeing more where the the soft skills and using creativity and imagination are directly connected to innovation and that's where the future is so it's no longer like a nice it's never been in my opinion but as a nation we have to wake up to the fact that um, programs like Kingston Book Festival and other players in literature and the creative industries, it's not a, a feel-good um, kind of thing. There are practical benefits to supporting the growth of our industry. Definitely. And I mean, we really appreciate you sharing that with us too. And I mean, we're looking forward to the festival in November. <laughs> I'm looking forward to it. Online, too. in person. <laughs> don't care. We just want it to come. So, And I have to, before going, I have to big up Chase. Um, you know, there's a lot of work to be done around how the arts are funded. We don't have an arts council, for example. So, you know, hardship fund for people going through this time is, is a non-existent thing. Thank God for the work of Casey in terms of grants and stuff that have been coming out. But I must say that Chase has been a consistent um, supporter of Kingston Book Festival over the years, um, allowing us to deliver a lot of the programming at no cost to the public, particularly our book fair. And so we have to really express gratitude um, to them for that kind of support, because honestly, without it, it wouldn't really be possible. Uh, we thank everybody who supports this initiative. And we thank you as well for sharing that with us. Before you go, just remind the friends where they can support or where they can follow Kingston um, Bookfest online and what it is they need to do to support this initiative. All right. So thank you for that. So one, um, clearly just following us at KGN Bookfest on IG and Insta um, and Twitter and Kingston Book Festival on Facebook um, is one way in terms of us being up. Um, connected and also amplifying our messages that we share and resharing uh, in terms of sponsors and partners we <laughs> welcome um, you know we have a couple of foundations like NCB Foundation JWN that have supported 
the book industry in terms of our mandate to promote reading for pleasure and, and learning. Uh, and then also in terms of merchandise, we partner with Rebel Women Lit, um, who have their online store with fabulous stuff, including KBF merchandise, totes, shirts. You know, that's something that we started up in 2018, last festival. And we want to grow that actually and expand it as a way of getting in, you know, some kind of funding and donations from the public in a transparent manner. All right, perfect. I mean, you can't have books and you don't have totes, so guys. <laughs> exactly. It's oh. just, that's a... <laughs> so thank you so much, Latoya, for joining us. And thank I'm you looking too. forward to the Kingston Book Festival, guys. It's yeah, so November fun. 30th to December 5th. Save the date. <laughs> don't be late. Thank you so much, Latoya. And thank, thank you, you for going to their Instagram and following them and going to Rebel, Rebel Women Lit's website and buying those totes and those shirts and supporting the initiative. Thank you so much. All right, guys, there you have it. There will be the Kingston Book Festival in November. Stay tuned for more information on that. We thank Latoya for sharing that information with us. And we keep the program moving, not just the same, where we hear some more, is it poetry? Is it reading? Is it nonfiction? Well, let's hear from the pre-magazine. We have a pre-recorded video to share with you. And the pre-magazine is a unique online magazine for new contemporary writing from and about the Caribbean. They publish original works of fiction, nonfiction, poetry, essays, interviews, experimental writing, and they give authors international visibility far beyond the islands. They want to encourage each of us to transmit our Caribbean writings, you know, whether it's through critics, editors, publishers, any of those who are seeking, you know, emerging talent and unheard voices. I mean, let's go ahead and listen to what they have to share with us today. Greetings, everyone. I'm very glad to be part of Kingston Creative's Hat Tip to Literature this month and part of their event, wonderful event, The City is Lit, the city being Kingston, of course. I want to introduce you to PRE, our online open access magazine of writing from the Caribbean. We started this in 2018 we being Diana McCauley, Isis Samaj Hall, and myself. We, the first issue of PRE came out in April 2018, and next month we'll be publishing our seventh issue of PRE. Um, yes, please look for PRE. If you want to know more about PRE, just go to prelit.com. It's freely available to anyone who cares to check it out. It's P -R, that's P -R -E -E -L -I -T com prelit.com. I also want to give you a preview of our first print edition. It's called Bookmarked and it contains selections from the first five issues of, of the digital magazine. It is a collector's item. No expense was spared in producing a you know, voluptuous volume, I should say. And I think you'll agree. I mean, look at these artworks. Have you ever seen a book as beautifully produced coming out of Jamaica? Well, you know, don't rush to answer that. But thanks, thanks for joining us. I'm now going to introduce you to four of our authors who are going to read for you. Um, there's three of them are actually, our, we, we gave scholarships to talented young writers under the age of 30. And three of them are here today. First is Yashika Graham from Jamaica, Tanisia Pratt from the Bahamas, and Ada M. Patterson from Barbados. Joining them will be our beloved novelist and short story writer, Roland Watson Grant. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the readings. And when you have a moment, do check us out at prelit.com. That's Pre, the magazine of Caribbean writing. Thanks and goodbye. Hello everyone. My name is Tanisia Pratt. I am a poet from the Bahamas. 
and today I will be reading from my upcoming collection titled Blue. The name of the poem is called All Our Mothers and it speaks a lot to the dichotomous relationship between mothers and daughters and how so often we can repeat patterns. So I hope you enjoy. All our mothers glued brown paper bits to our heads with their spit, sucked the snot from our noses, circled fingers round our throats in hopes we find our own voice. Their hollowed hopes nourished our bellies with each suckle, prayers, perforated protection on our souls. All our mothers dreamed to one day be dangerous women with unhinged limbs and sword pit mouths before being laden with husbands and children of other women. They told us to never be them. They taught us we never stray from kin. All our mothers sowed seeds. All their burdens grew weeds, sprouting bromeliads in our chests, stifling our own potential. Thank you. The fact that it is difficult for me to love this place makes me know this love matters. Mine is a love that struggles to be loving. It takes work and can't be given to me in the way some people here have it out of ignorance and ease or from a kind of defaulting. I need to love this place with intention or not at all. My love needs to swim in deep waters. My love needs the risk of sharks. It needs to be too far out. It needs to risk a drowning. My love needs to risk a different kind of return to the shoreline. It needs deep breaths, muscle cramp, and salt water. It needs all the gills it can find. It needs buoyant lungs and gas bladders. It needs sharks that swim too close for comfort. Because it could never fly to begin with, my love needs to suck salt, sink deep, and swim in afterlives. My love needs afterloves. How beautiful. Thank you so much for joining, for sharing that with us. That was amazing. Now, I think at this point, we will definitely go to another poet, a musical poet, whose name is Sheldon Williams, who goes by the name Ka Meds. Now, please enjoy his performance. Yeah, Kingston Creative. John you know me? I have to share a story with you, know, you know? While I go, I come upstairs and I see some whole heap of in the parking lot downstairs. I see, eh? I see Benz and I see BMW. And it just bring me back to my experience I have with me. Just. I have to share it. Now watch me now. I want the Tara. Want Suzuki like a Grand Vivitara or a brand new Nissan Navara? If you buy her a Nissan March, she gone by April. You're gonna need Spraga Benz to get her me back. I bet I'm a handbrake than my heart. This girl have an automotive art. She pushed me from the start. The wind never shield me from a rat. When we look back, it did better my walk. Now take note, my date mark X, but it just never fit. My buyer a Nissan, infidelity. Take back my Nissan for infidelity. 
Now everywhere I go in my Nissan, the X Trail, I couldn't exhale. I get a link on the navigator of a set sail. At first it was Odyssey. They planned for show Honda City. She preferred the nightlife. But I say Hon, they better when it's sunny. She preferred the nightlife because she loved the stars. I mean I talk about the Subaru stars. I talk the silver star. And not the silver star where you get for gallantry from war, but the Benz insignia was shine from far when German engineering gripped the tar and sport mode sings sweet like guitar. They plan for stand up in our life on a shift. Cause the love felt automatic. Until she beat a man in a brand new AMG formatic. Where the four rims were shiny and chromatic. And when the Benz gas pedal floor and the engine roar, she get melodramatic and ecstatic. Plus the man did have some really deep pockets. Anyway, she move on and me move on and one day me buy parts. You know, Subaru parts in a KIG. Get an instant message upon IG. What me the message? Hi, it's me. Can you meet me in halfway three anytime after three? It's like this girl take man for press button like car when I use key. Dog me just tell her for flee. Now she has sent me topless pics. In convertible. And I asked if I want CRV. CRV with two double D. She take her snap in a mini with her legacy in the Subaru Outback. We trace back her tracks. X1 and X2 was Ross. And she pull out them locks. When them try by her pro box, she hang around her card, but her, she really want a tundra. And a ridge line she want if it's a Honda. You see Nissan T and Daya Tamira. She don't want that neither. She have every automotive page in the Sunday Gleaner. So youths, before you get caught, pray the girl where you are with and make sure she never have a automotive art. Pray the girl where you are link with and make sure she never automotive art don't rush in for fulfill a swift desire you know make sure looking at the mirror at herself she never need running shoes for the jog you know <laughs> from all the terminal me take lauren to the hill so sick it has terminally ill four rings on the grill non-stop to the grill automotive art Remember one here to know, automotive, art, automotive, art, yeah, so that's the automotive art, you know, when I said no go destroy in a relationship, you know, that's a good some advice, you see me, good advice, yeah, all right, I'm going to move into something else now, so, we know so Jamaica is a place where, you know, everybody like dress up and fashion and style and thing. And, you know, you have the affordable stuff and then you have the not so affordable stuff. And you have some people can put anything together and make it look fashionable. So that one, for, oh no, no, we call that one a clean. Yeah. Your ropey. You know, me not like chores, but me clean every day. When we say brand, and a whole weight, we are talking about some brand for the whole week. I not disown my family when I cut off jeans. I now forgot gym to get most of it with short sleeves. No coffee stain on the palm of white tees. Without submarine or navy seals. My barrel come with the old navy overseas and me. Now for farm with April for see all the bees and you. Now for smile for you see the cheese. In a desert, I'm a tank top. Now for going a desert, pan tank top. And a bread me go buy when my gun shop. But I walk with the bread when my gun shop. Our man in the exchange a pan shop. The perfect fit na sell a under car shop. I'm not procrastinator, I'm not joker. I'm not time waste upon sofa. But when you see me, you say loafer. Now, as I said before, when we say brand and a whole weight, 
We are talking about some things for the whole week now. Second verse. My shoes can't talk, but my shoes are converse. I only my belt alone reverse. I'm in half a dress rears. I see a girl now, pencil skirt, a flirt. I tell me she love my shirt. So clean, no dirt. I don't need visa for see New Jersey. My van's Dutch, Robin Van Persie. Me have forever 21 even at age 30. Poop brush showing the clock smell dirty. Me got dark side and Sibaga boat shoes. No, not one, two pairs of boat shoes. But on a boat where you capsize. Size 7 I'm a Yankee capsize. Me not malnourished, but me have slim ties. With that cross all T's and that all eyes. But that it is across all eyes. Christian Dior now backslide. Now for where my jaggers got track side. Man, I really like stepper. With my cracks, I don't have to worry about nepa. I lift a leather, a alligator. I fly American Airlines with American people. In a diesel jeans and an American eagle. <laughs> In a plain shirt from Aero Pastel. Clean daily. Ask smell. She said, Oh, you say clean, you're a helper. I said, No, just an immaculate pelper. <laughs> we don't need clothes pin to get my clothes online. One click, Amazon Prime. I don't need clothes pin to get my clothes online. One click, Amazon Prime. I don't need clothes pin to get my clothes online. One click, Amazon Prime. That are the fresh one out of plastic, you know. We call that one the clean. Oh, I never miss your brand. Yeah. Now this one my family when I cut off jeans. Now this one my family when I cut off jeans. Yeah. Clean. All right, all right, all right. That was calm meds for your ears. That was a dope point. That was that was fire. So join us online. Tell us how you felt about that and follow him on all social media. His handle is calm. That's K A L M underscore meds M E D Z. So there you have it. We have calm has given us that wonderful dub poetry performance. We thank him so much for that one. So we're gonna go straight into our next performance, and that's the pre segment. Number two. Hello, I'm Yashika Graham, and this is an excerpt from my short story, Birdie. It begins with this quote. Nursing home hostage seeks young accomplice, must be willing to fight and not afraid of cold water, pays well, name starting with C need not apply, walk in interviews this Sunday from 10am at Harris Memorial Home with Margaret Bird. It's in the voice of Margaret. In part, I really wanted some sensible conversation. In part, I wanted these imposters exposed. I mean, imagine. My own nephew that I raised with my two hands, a thing I never did with a child of my own, take me up as soon as my brother passed, say I am too much trouble, that a nursing home would provide more dedicated care for me. As if I'm a child, as if I never raised the blasted boy practically by myself when him father was building a career. If somebody did tell me the exact thing, I wouldn't believe them. I would tell them, no, no. It's lie you're telling. No way Craig would do me that. Not after all I sacrifice. But see there, as God live it, I hold my mouth and see me a butter butter through it. Still, even after I land here, I never quite intended to create no excitement in the people them place, if you can believe that. I just wanted people to know what was really going on. Don't ask me how I put the ad in the, in the paper in the first place. I have my ways. About three people answered it. One man after the other showed up in the Sunday heat right after morning devotion. I was taking my time going back to my room when I heard the commotion on the veranda. 
So I stop and lean in the crack of my doorway where I could see down the hallway and hear them explain themselves. Yes, miss, I used to be a security guard. I wasn't sure, but that's what you're looking for, right? Another one said, I used to play karate when I was in primary school, you know, and I'm not too soft on the bushwork either. Sir, is that the paper? May I see it, please? Nurse Johnson took the paper and started reading. Nursing home hostage. I knew it wouldn't be long before it got to the matron and before she read the whole thing and see my name. Yes, yes, I know. Beatrice already said it wasn't a good idea to put my name in it, but I was convinced I would get to talk to the people that way. Birdie, you're only setting yourself up for trouble, my love. I think you should leave it alone. Bedridden, she had whispered to me as I propped myself against the protective railing of her bed. Of course, I hadn't agreed or listened. Beatrice, how long you been in this prison place? Maybe you quite are right with how them treat you, but I'm not having it. Now at my desk, my back to the door, the next thing I know is that Matron and Nurse Johnson were knocking and barging in at the same time. Can I help you, ladies? Miss Bird, we understand that you, the Matron, started. I am quite busy, as you can imagine. I am I'm writing a letter to Craig to tell him some new things I've discovered about him. Then Nurse Johnson come in with, Miss Bird, this is a serious matter. I'm thinking of Junker for this week. I know it's not that fresh. A bit overused even, but I don't think I ever used it on him before. So it might sting after all. What do you think, Nurse? Nurse? Miss Bird, you are not permitted to issue advertisements concerning this facility to disturb my staff or my patients, including yourself. The matron was stern, like she meant to jerk me. I am not your patient, miss. I don't even belong in this place. Nurse Johnson, please call Mr. Bird and file a formal report for the board. Clearly, this is not being taken seriously. Thank you. Hi everybody, my name is Roland Watson Grant and today I'm going to be reading for you an excerpt from my story Crocodile Tears. The story so far is that the lovely fish vendors of Cannonball Beach in Jamaica have been losing money because of a very menacing, very unwelcome visitor that has been plaguing Cannonball Beach and making them lose sales. So if you haven't read Crocodile Tears, grab a paddle and let's hit the water. Well. That same week, the crocodile attacked some tourists who didn't get the memo that the Grinch was patrolling Cannonball Beach. Now, this was in broad daylight when the seawater green and pretty, sparkling like sequins where the sunlight touched the surface. Well, here come two tourists kayaking from another beach and reach over Cannonball with GoPro camera mounted on helmets to capture their adventures in paradise. People call out loud and tell them, go back, go back. But you know that the more Jamaican people twang, is the less tourists understand. So the tourists just hold up their paddle and say, yeah, Irie man, Irie, until suddenly there was a shadow in the water. Grinch swim underneath the boat and bounce it over and it was one hell and powder house inside the water. If the tourists never had paddle to slap Grinch backside until he decided it wasn't worth it, the whole thing would have made international news. Well, that same evening, police and soldiers swarmed the beach and searched for Grinch. Poor auntie, she's so frightened when she see the military. She fling the apron with the ganja and the ganja money into the cooking fire because she swear where she police come from. Anyway, after dark, Jamaica defense soldier find the crocodile, tie up his mouth and carry him off the beach. The vendors clap and cheer but when the soldiers march past the lobster shop, Auntie Pauline she so vexed for the ganja that get burned up plus all the money she lose since, since summer because of this crocodile, she just walk all the way to the gate behind the soldiers and cuss out the poor reptile. Damn ugly brutes, old Satan, old Grinch, you mouth long like Marjorie one. Go back over your swamp and don't come back over here, come mash up people's business. And some vendor say, all right, Pauline, all right, and try to calm her down. But auntie kiss her teeth and come back inside the lobster shop, still cussing. Me have mortgage to pay every month. Damn crocodile, quite all right.
Wow, thank you so much, Tree. That was amazing. Thank you to all of those performances. If you want to find out more about Pre, you can visit their website at www.prelit.com and you can check out all that they have to offer. And of course, if you can cop a copy of the book that was presented to us earlier. Thank you so much, Pre. So next up, we'll be looking at, you know, script to screen with Michael Holgate. If you're just joining us, this is a Kingston Creative Art Walk and the city is lit today. We're talking about literature whether it's poetry, whether it's screenwriting, whether it's novels, you name it, we're talking about it today. And you're gonna be listening to Michael Holgate as he talks about his recently prepared Ch Chill, the series. And he'll talk about his process in writing, in ideation and creating this wonderful product. And we may even get a glimpse of it. Please enjoy this conversation with Michael Holgate. Hello, my name is Michael Holgate and I am the writer, director of Chill the Series, now showing on YouTube at The Ashe Company. Chill the Series is a production that looks at life in present day Jamaica. It takes a look at the millennial scene and how these young people are dealing with life in their Jamaica, you know, and, and it, it looks at how they are negotiating with the issues of sexuality and health and uh, just surviving and business and how do they become the type of individuals that they want to become what has life in jamaica prepared them to be this world is a new world you know and and how are they navigating this world in a way that keeps them healthy and happy and vibrant and alive and so chill looks at what they are doing in a non-threatening way, look at looks, looks at all of these issues in a in a humorous and light way, with a, a serious undercurrent of understanding that human nature is fraught with a lot of difficulties and challenges. But we just have to navigate it and and go ahead and do stuff about it and and and, and make it work for us, you know. And as a writer. Uh, it, it was my job to ensure that these characters are portrayed in a realistic way from before anybody even started acting out the roles. As a director, my job was to ensure that the writing was brought to life on screen in a way that represented the writer, but also represented the, 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 the characters and the, the persons who are being portrayed in this way. First and foremost, in everything and in everything, I am a writer. If I'm if I'm choreographing a dance, I write it down. Better believe it, I write it down. If I'm directing, I'm writing down exactly how I'm going to direct this. A part of that is research and writing. And that goes heavily into how I operate whenever I'm doing any creative product. There is always that healthy dose of research that takes place at the beginning of it. And throughout, I'm always doing some sort of research to ensure that what it is that, you know, there's some sort of rigor in what it is that I am doing and saying and presenting and representing to people, you know. So uh, that's it. I, I, I really am primarily a writer. I love writing. It's what I live for. And I love creating worlds. I love creating characters. I love how characters come in relationship with each other. And in those relationships, so many themes come out and not just themes, but ideas and, uh, and and issues that need to be dealt with by the society, issues that we as individuals need to deal with. As a writer, I'm also very invested in ensuring that people see themselves, people see themselves as characters uh, 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 um, on stage and on screen and hear themselves, hear their own voices and feel fully represented, feel like their personality and their character and their culture is respected. One of my missions, my goals as a writer is to showcase Jamaican culture, Caribbean culture, our, our cultural archetypes, you know, um, in a way that is as potent as when you hear the Kumina drums beating. I want, I want, when, when you hear Kumina drums beating, it does something to you. You feel it in your rhythm, you feel it in your body, you feel the rhythm in your body, you feel it in your soul, your, your heart it almost goes in sync with that. Doo -doo, doo -doo, doo -doo, doo -doo. You feel that rhythm. And I want my, my writing to, to convey the same type of 
energy and emotion and feeling and, and aesthetic. And uh, that's what I believe my, I hope my writing does for people. And that's definitely what it does for me. I feel alive when I write. How do I write? How do I write? That's a kind of tricky one. Um, how do I write? I write by writing and rewriting. You know, they say writing is rewriting and that's an essential part of what I do. But interestingly, especially for Chill, what I did was I wrote the series, I wrote the, I'd write each episode and then I would rewrite it and then I'd also rewrite it in the process of directing it, which a lot of directors do, not just for film, but also for theatre. Um, and, and that's what I did. But generally speaking, when I am writing, my process is I get an idea and, you know, immediately I start to look for a, a title or a topic or not themes or anything, but I look for um, a main topic or title. And then as soon as I get that, I jot that down to kind of, because the title and the topic kind of fleshes out the, the concept and everything for me. I have the title, the topic. And then I just start jotting things down in my phone. I just jot, jot, jot. Every idea that comes to me, I jot it down in my phone. And I, and I realize that once I start thinking about an idea of something that I'm going to write, things just keep racing towards me. I'll be driving in the car and I hear a music and I just like, oh my God, that just makes so much sense. And something clicks for me and then I say, all right, yes. Then I just put that into my phone and my memo pad on the phone and I just keep the ideas going and I keep the ideas flowing. Sometimes when I'm writing, I don't try to get all the ideas in properly at the time because as I say, writing is rewriting. So I get all the ideas in this initial phase just to get a feeling and an energy down. And then in the rewriting process, I formalize and um, finalize and edit and make it much better than it could be. And I try not to go for perfectionism. I, I reach a place always where I just say, you know, enough is enough. And I let it go. Let it go like a child has to be born at some point in time. Because as a writer, sometimes it's so much, it's, it's so easy to get caught up in writing forever and ever. Amen. Non-stop. And never reaching that end product. And at the end of the day, you will be known as a wonderful person who could have been a good writer, but the world will never know because you have never produced anything. That's not going to be me. I'm going to finish things. So it reaches a point where um, you, know, you just stop and you let it go. Wow, thank you so much. That was Michael Holgate, the writer and director of the series called Chill. You know, such a chilling series, we should say. And if you haven't watched it, you can check it out on the Ashe Company's YouTube channel where you can, you know, enjoy that episode. And of course, let us know or let him, them know how you feel about that series by following them online at the Ashe Group. So thank you guys for joining us for that segment with Michael Holgate. Today we're talking about literature. It's all about writing, whether it's poetry, whether it's novels, whether it's screenwriting. It's really all about words today. And we could not have done today or talked about literature or poetry at all without talking about the Poet Laureate of 2021 to 2024, Olive Senior. And today she'll present an address and share some of her poetry with us. She's a Jamaican poet, a novelist, a short story writer who is based in Toronto in Canada. And she was also awarded the Musgrave Gold Medal in 2005 by the Institute of Jamaica for her contributions to literature. So please sit back and enjoy this address from Olive Senior. Hello. I'm Olive Senior, Poet Laureate of Jamaica for 2021 to 2024. I'm absolutely delighted to be here on this Art Walk and I want to congratulate Kingston Art Walk for the amazing, amazing work that you're doing in promoting cultural communities in Jamaica and also promoting Jamaica abroad as a world city of creativity and culture. And I look forward to, to being able to work with Kingston Creative during my tenure 
as Poet Laureate. For today, it's just wonderful to be here. And in I've taken note of the topic which or the theme, which I think is literature or liter literary activities, but also we're at the tail end of, I think, the International Month celebrating women. So I want to read two brief poems that I wrote many, many years apart, but they are very similar in some ways because what they're demonstrating is that in times of crisis, we all suffer, but the, the burden, the greatest burden in poor countries seems to be always on women, the poor women who have responsibility for families. So the first poem that I'm gonna read is in my latest book, which is called Pandemic Poems First Wave. I wrote these poems last year and the each poem is using as its title and theme a word that was generated by the pandemic. So this one is called L for Locked Out. Some things are beyond the cutting edge of poems, like this true story, BBC report with photographs of this widow in a far off land in lockdown, no income, six children and no food. She puts water in the cooking pot, adds stones and tells them to wait for soup. They know she's lying. Their crying alerts a neighbor who arranges assistance. Thus, that old stone soup tale is reenacted. But this is not meant to be an allegory of craftiness or kindness. You can read it simply as a reflection on how an invisible virus can make visible that other pandemic, the collateral damage to half the world without the means to withstand it. The next poem I wrote, um, it's in my book, Gardening in the Tropics. So some of you might know it. It's one of um, poems that are called hurricane poems. And this one, or Hurricane Story, this is Hurricane Story 1988. And you might see some similarities between this mother and the mother in the pandemic poems. Hurricane Story 1988. My mother wasn't christened Imelda, but she stashed a cache of shoes beneath the bed. She used to travel to Haiti, Panama, Curacao, Miami. Wherever there was bargain to catch, even shoes that didn't have batch. Back home, she could always find customer come down to look and talk where she plant herself on sidewalk. When the hurricane hit, she banned her belly and ball, five flights a day to Miami grounded, no sail, and her shoes getting ginger from the damp since the roof decamp and the rest sitting in customs impounded. My mother banked between her breasts, lived out her dreams in a spliff or two each night. Since the storm, things so tight, her breasts shrivel, the notes shrinking. Every night she there thinking, every morning she get up and she wail, Lord, life so soak up and no bailout to rotted. Thank you very much and have a great walk. Thanks for inviting me. Bye. That was the amazing Olive Senior, Jamaica's Poet Laureate for 2021 to 2024. We thank her so much for joining us today and for giving us that beautiful address. I mean, it's been a wonderful day just listening to all the poets, the writers today. Please share with them online what you felt about their work and how you feel about what they're doing, you know, in when it comes to literature in Jamaica. Please, of course, share with us, you know, your moments today. Join us on Instagram, Kingston Creative JM or Twitter at KGN Creative. And to close us out today, we'll have a performance because of course there is no Jamaica without music or performances and there is no writing or there is no music without writing. So let us listen to our final performance for today. And this is from Ken Ellis, please enjoy.
tastes like strawberries on that summer evening and it sounds just like a song i want more berries and that summer feeling so wonderful and warm breathe me breathe me out yes i don't know if i could ever go Thinking of love, yes. Don't know if I could ever go without watermelon sugar high, watermelon sugar high, watermelon sugar high, watermelon sugar high, strawberry that summer evening, baby, you're the end of June. Your belly and that summer feeling ooh, getting washed away in you. Breathe me in, breathe me out. Yes. I don't know if I could ever go without watermelon sugar high, watermelon sugar high, watermelon sugar high, watermelon sugar high. Watermelon sugar, high. watermelon sugar, high. watermelon sugar, high. watermelon sugar. High. I just wanna taste it. I just wanna taste it. Watermelon sugar. I just wanna taste it. I just wanna taste it. Watermelon. Strawberries that summer evening it sounds just like a song. I want your belly and that summer feeling so wonderful and warm. out loud I don't know if I could ever go without watermelon sugar high 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 watermelon sugar sun will shine again after the rainfall. these tough times right now you know we know there are so many lives that have been lost I still want you to know that despite all the rains and all the dark clouds the sun will shine again this is Ken Ellis King Sun Crater look at the trees Dancing on and on, how do you feel? Look at the skies, put your hopes and dreams, so high they fly high. Don't need to worry now, 
Take your time, don't you hurry now. No. The sun will shine again after the rain falls. Ooh, the sun will shine again after the rain falls. In your life, do you see what you want to see when you stand? Do you realize that if you have some faith, you can go anywhere? We all gonna see that day. Yeah. Sun will shine again after the rain falls. Sun will shine again after the rain After the rain.
feeling deeper Tempting me to write new a love song Thank you so much, Ken. Ken, that was such a beautiful performance from Ken Ellis. We really appreciate that performance. And we thank you everyone for joining us today for the Kingston Creative Art Walk. The city is lit today. And I want to just leave with you a quick quote from one of my poems. I mean, today we have so many different reasons to be down, but this quote from one of my poems called Nature's Joy is a mantra that I try to live by. It's, I choose happiness, the light wind of joy brushing against the flushed cheeks of my face, the scattered pollens of bliss kissing my hair strands. So I encourage all of you today to choose happiness, to use your words to encourage someone else, or even the words of some of the poets and writers that joined us today. Thank you so much for joining us. This is the Kingston Creative Art Walk. The city is very lit today. Share all your quotes with us online, at Kingston Creative JM on Instagram or KGN Creative on Twitter or Kingston Creative JM on Facebook as well. Thank you so much, my beautiful people, for joining me. I'm Tavia, and this is.